Welcome to the whirlpool of the unsolved, where the unsolved is questioned and dissected. I'm Frank, and today's episode, we will be talking about the boy in the box. A name given to an unidentified victim who was presumably from the age of four to six years old, found in the Fox Chase area of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on a February's winter day of 1957, wrapped in a plaid blanket an innocent human still to live life, taken from whatever future he may have lived, something dark that's seen caused by someone that may live in darkness but pretend to live in light, such innocence taken so fast, but why? The boy in the box was found in the Fox Chase area of Philadelphia, as said earlier, specifically in the woods off Susquehanna Road. That area that he was found in was was very still pretty much rural, with plenty of trees and long roads, a place of silence and the sounds of nature still roam during that time. He was found in February of 1957, and they started their investigation to this case on the 26th of February. He was first found by John Stachowiak, forgive me for that, (laughs) while he was checking for his muskrat traps he didn't report his findings though a few days later a man named frank guthrum who was a college student he spotted a rabbit run into an underbush knowing that there were normally traps laid out in this area he decided to investigate and see if there were any after going towards where the rabbit had gone he found the box and the boy inside of it he was reluctant to go to the police about it as john was But after a day, he decided to go to the police station and tell them what he had found in the woods. Just a side note, John didn't go to the police because he feared that the police would confiscate his traps as well. The child was found in a cardboard box that contained once a bassinet from J.C. Penney's. The boy's head looked to be freshly cut, which some people believe may have happened after his death, since there were actually clumps of hair still on him. He seemed to look severely malnourished, as well as surgical scars on his ankle and groin area. He also had an L-shaped scar on the bottom of his chin. His body was wrapped around with a plaid blanket. The theories of what may have happened to this child, nobody really knows what really happened to this innocent child, but there are thoughts about what may have happened. Clearly, there's theories. Some believe that he may have been born to the stepdaughter of a foster parent, which they chose to dump the body so nobody would know his stepdaughter had a child being unwed. They say that the death was possibly accidental. This was Remington Bristow's theory, of course, who was an employee of the medical examiner. Another theory was about a woman named Martha, also known as M, who had spoken to the police in 2002. The police believed that she had told them was plausible, but at the same time was troubled by her history of mental illness. Martha had claimed that her mother had purchased this boy from his parents back in the summer of 1954, and the child was very much abused by her mother. That one day while he was eating, he felt sick to where he threw up the beans that he had eaten. Apparently, M's mother was angered and banged the boy's head to the ground until he was semi-unconscious. Then she took him to bathe, where he eventually died. The mother then cut the boy's hair and had told M to help her dump the body, which eventually they did. The police believed this was all possible because what was held about the child after its examination was all basically brought up with her story. But when investigation... But when investigating, the people who would have been their neighbors, they admitted to never seeing a boy in their home or anybody that they didn't know. 
as well as not having any witnesses. Another theory is a theory by Frank Bender, who believes that the boy may have been raised as a girl and that haircut was performed in a haste. His theory is based by the styling of the boy's eyebrow. Now, where did this boy come from? Nobody knows where this boy is originally from. Clearly, this is all a mystery that is still unsolved to this day. But there are people that believe that he was a child of immigrants that settled in Pennsylvania in the 50s. Others, like the one of the theories above, believe that the child was born there in Philadelphia. All in all, nobody knows where this child came from. And honestly, that's a sad story in itself. When it comes to my personal thoughts about this whole entire thing about this whole entire case, I will be very, very honest. I kind of lean more towards the Martha theory. Uh, every theory has its pros and cons with possibly being the foster father's stepdaughter's son. It is possible. Uh, you got to think about the time period and um, it's in the 50s. So it's possible that he didn't want his daughter to have a child being unwed and that would put a bad look on the family and things of that nature. We have seen it historically how parents can be towards uh, their children, especially during that age. So, I mean, during that time where it's very possible that this may have occurred. And apparently from research, um, I have seen that the house of this foster uh, father's home, this foster parent's home, was not far from where the body was dumped. So it's possible. And like I said, during that time, it was still very much rural. You had plenty of woods. I'm originally from Philadelphia, so I know this area. And I can honestly say that it is a lot more... There's a lot more homes. There's really no trees in that area now, so I can only picture it. And then I've also researched photos of how it looked during that time. And to be honest, it had plenty of woods. So it is very likely that this could have happened. But I kind of jump back to the theory of Martha, of the woman named Martha. From researching, I can see that in reality... Martha had explained the beans that was eaten. And when they did the autopsy and the examination, they had found remnants of beans in this boy's stomach, uh, meaning that he had eaten that prior to his death, which the police had never put out there in the newspaper or anything like that. That was actually something that they kept to themselves. So if somebody were to admit to this horrendous crime, or if they were to find out who did this horrendous crime, um, this would be one of those things that they can actually use as well as the fact that police believe that the hair was cut probably after death. Um, Martha saying that, her mother had cut the boy's hair um, after the boy was dead, after bathing him, kind of indicates that as well. Now, when you go deeper into this, when you go deeper into this mystery and this, you know, case, it does get a little bit tricky because there's plenty of theories. I Specifically, just wanted to bring up the three theories that are most spoken about because honestly, I feel like they're the most relative. And in reality, I feel like the two have a higher probability of being truthful. I really lean on Martha's for so many reasons. Not only is the fact that she breaks down exactly what may have happened, but at the same time, it's one of those things where you're like, Wow, you're hitting it on the head almost. The boy's face and body looked to be abused. He had scars on his ankle 
and his groin area, as well as an L-shaped scar on his chin, which indicates abuse, which she clearly stated that her mother had done. Now, I comprehend the fact that she had mental illness, a history of mental illness, but this is my key question is, did this history of mental illness, did she always have it? Or is it possible that after this specific situation that had occurred, she had a mental breakdown? She had lost her mind because if that is the case, this is something that she has been possibly living with for a very long time and just felt as though it was time to release that and tell the truth. And hopefully that would make her feel better. That's why I leaned a lot into Martha's um, admittance of what may have happened. You know, there's something there that honestly I feel like the police kind of overlooked. And yes, they believed it was probable and they believed that it may have happened, but no witnesses know anything. And I comprehend the fact of asking who were their neighbors and stuff like that. Um, if they ever seen this boy or anything like that. And I comprehend the boy, you know, the neighbors not knowing anything because to be realistic, how many times have we not seen videos on YouTube or on any platform whatsoever, uh, or docuseries or anything like that, where houses have, uh, secret rooms or secret doors. Is it possible that, uh, Martha's mother may have had a secret door or a secret room in the basement because keep in mind the homes in Philadelphia do have basements and I can recall when I was a kid uh, we had this basement where there was this hole that went underneath a different part of the house now it wasn't blocked whatsoever with a door or anything like that but it was a hole nonetheless and my thing is is that it's possible that her mother could have had a hidden room or a secret door and put this child there so nobody would know, probably gag the boy or anything like that so he wouldn't make any sounds or soundproof the room or whatever the case may be. I think that Martha admitting to these things shouldn't have been held to a lower standard because of her history with mental illness. That's just my personal um, opinion about the whole entire thing. Now, like I said, there's plenty more theories about this case, and there's so much more to go on about this case. But my job here is to introduce you to these cases so you can take a look for yourself. And I'm hoping that in reality, you're enjoying this show. This is only the third episode, but I'm I'm planning to keep on going with this. So with that said, you have an idea of my theories and what I believe. Honestly, I believe Martha wholeheartedly just because everything almost adds up more than the issue with the foster parent, though possible, I don't think is as close to what Martha had said and even saying things that was withheld by the police for specific reason. That's just my thought and my theories. Like I said, thank you for joining this episode and joining this show and taking a listen to it. If you do enjoy it, I ask that you go ahead and you um, subscribe, uh, like this uh, show, this podcast and that if you don't mind in support of this show that you go ahead and share it to somebody that may also like unsolved mysteries i appreciate your support and we'll be back with another one next week till next time